good morning and welcome to worship. Let's begin with prayer. God, we thank you for this day, your presence with us, your spirit that has called us to follow you and to, to be your people, and for your promise that you gather with us when we gather in your name for worship. Lord, may your presence be felt by us all, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, I'd like to welcome everyone, including those viewing online for the Los Banos and the Dos Palos United Methodist Churches. And let's begin with our first hymn, Stand By Me. And as you're able, I invite you to stand to sing. <coughs> somebody comes by and they're in a, in a crisis mode and they want something they can take and it's a homeless person and they don't have a kitchen um, and so sometimes cans that have the pull top lids they don't just have can openers available so we need some more of those things maybe some old things that are some canned meats or something like that that they can use a pull top is useful but any canned goods are, are useful as well also want to announce our our offering which is a part of part of our worship service and we have a box in the narthex where you can place an offering or you can mail it into the church office or you can give through the online giving app available through the website or on your phone and if there are no other announcements I invite Kathy Ford to help us with singing I'm forever grateful
to our prayer time and service. What joys or concerns would you like to lift up that we could pray about together? Today is Kathy's birthday. For Deb Mills, brother in the hospital. I'm going to give thanks also for Kathy. She had cataract surgery during this week. And, <clears throat> and there's a, because they had to replace the lens, there, um, she might not need to wear the contacts that she had to wear so that her, her eyes can have better vision uncorrected than it, than it used to. So she's, she's still recovering from that. And has the other eye in a couple of weeks. Emory is the 12 year old who had the leg amputated. Yeah, that, that phantom pain, it's real pain, just <clears throat> nerves are still there, they just got cut off shorter. I want to lift up families. We have a particular family in mind that is, is threatened with, there was some infidelity and um, it's a very painful situation. Just lift up families in general and that family in particular. Let's join together in praying. God, we thank you that, <clears throat> that you do come to us, that you came to seek and save the lost. Lord, we thank you for, for creating this wonderful universe and world. And Lord, for giving us that, that dangerous gift of freedom so that we could respond to you in love. Lord, even knowing that, that we would misuse that and often turn away from you and we've caused literally a world of hurt through turning away from you. But Lord, you, you didn't turn away from us. You kept coming after us. You sent Jesus to be our Savior, to die on the cross, to take our sins away. Lord, you've given that promise that if we confess our sins, that you are faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us. And so we come to you now acknowledging that, that we have sinned, that we have turned away, but that we hear your voice of love and mercy and we, we come trusting in your promise of forgiveness. We come trusting in the power of the blood of Jesus. We confess our sins and we trust ourselves to your healing and cleansing. We thank you that you accept us as we are in spite of what we've done and you love us. Lord, give us that assurance each day and give us that assurance that you are at work in our lives to transform us. We thank you for your gifts to us. I want to thank you for Kathy and for celebrating this past year and this next year of her life. And we thank you for this eye surgery and for the improved vision that she's already experiencing. And just ask for complete healing and, and successful second operation as well. We thank you for all that you do in her and through her, and we look forward to this next year, which you have in store. Lord, we also thank you for our nation. Lord, we've just gone through an election, and we thank you that we have that privilege for the freedoms that we have, and particularly the freedom to worship you as we see fit. And Lord, we know that the freedoms can be, can be a dangerous thing too if we're not exercised with responsibility. The freedoms can be an irritating thing because everybody else has them too and they get to do things that maybe aren't pleasing to us. So I ask that you give us that grace and responsibility to use, use our freedoms and we ask for your blessings on our nation, particularly all of our leaders as, as some elections still need to be redone and other people are, are about to take office, and others are returning. Lord, that, that this would be a new year with a new spirit, and that you would guide all of our leaders to, to work together, and to work not just for the good of a party or the good of themselves, but for the good of all, and that you would give us wisdom to know what that is. Lord, we lift up 
our families. And Lord, many families are stressed with issues from the pandemic, not being able to go and do the things that they're accustomed to doing, maybe being out of work, maybe being short of money, maybe dealing with illness and loss, maybe lacking that extended family support. Lord, we lift up, we lift up our marriages, and particularly those that are under pressure. Lord, lift up those that are that are broken painfully, and, and one in, in mind that, where there's been infidelity. Lord, we just ask that that you bring your healing and restoring, transforming power at work in that whole situation. And Lord, you you only know what is what is best to proceed from here, and we just trust that to you and ask that your will would be done in this family. Lord, we lift up those that are caught up in addictions and ask for healing and strength. We thank you for the 12-step groups that meet in our church buildings and ask for, for them to find that contact with you. Lord, that their higher power wouldn't be just a vague idea, but they would know that, that it is you. We ask for healing for Deb's brother, hospital and support for the whole family. We lift up Emory, a 12-year-old who had to have her leg amputated to, because of cancer. Lord, ask for relief from pain, for continued physical healing, for protection from the cancer. And Lord, we ask for, for you to comfort her in the grief over the loss of the limb and the assurance that you are with her and upholding her and her family. Lord, we ask that your love would be made clear to them. And Lord, we thank you for this congregation, for the love that you've given us for you and for one another and for the world. Lord, lead us into new ways to express that love beyond our walls, even during a time when our, our outreach has been curtailed or hampered in some ways with the COVID restrictions. Guide us. And Lord, we ask for for you to restrain the COVID virus and lead to, to treatments and vaccine and responsible action. Lord, help us to worship you in all that we do, including praying the Lord's Prayer together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Here's a reading of God's word from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14, beginning with verse 22. This was just after Jesus had fed the 5,000 out on a, a lonely place. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But the boat was already a considerable distance from land buffeted by the waves because the wind was against it. During the fourth watch of the night, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, Take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You of little faith, he said, why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly, you are the Son of God. Jesus, may your word to us convince us of who you are and what you can mean in our lives. 
speak now through these words of scripture and through these words of the sermon. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, the, um, the Methodist preacher and the Baptist preacher and the Pentecostal preacher decided to um, go fishing one day. And so they got in a little rowboat and they rowed their way out of, up just a little ways, so not too far from the dock, and so it was a good spot there. And they, they start fishing and they're like, oh, darn it. I'm saying, I, I forgot the worms. And, and the Methodist preacher said, no problem, I'll get them. Steps out of the boat and walks across the water, over to the dock, goes into the car, gets the worms, walks back, they start fishing. They go on a little while later, and, and then one says, oh, I left the thermos of coffee in the truck. No problem, the Pentecostal preacher says, and he, he hops out of the boat, walks on the water, Goes and gets coffee, walks back, and they drink the coffee. Then a little while later, the, um, they, they realize, we forgot the sandwiches. They're in the, in the cooler in the back of the truck. And, and the Baptist says, okay, I'll do it. I'll do it. I'll do it. And so you know, he, he thinks, you know, they can do it, I can do it. And he steps out of the boat <laughs> into the water. And he climbs, he held him back in the boat, says, all right, you want us to go? No, 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 I got it, I got it. And he steps out of the boat, <laughs> splashes in the water. And he climbs back in. Third time, he climbs out, splashes in the water. And the, and the Pentecostal preacher says to the Methodist, you know, as entertaining as this is, don't you think it would be more Christian if we showed them where the stepping stone rocks were? <laughs> this story of walking on the water is one of Jesus' most famous miracles. But I want to look at it today in regard to the coming of Jesus. We're nearing the Advent season where we talk about Jesus coming as the babe born in, in Bethlehem. And, and we think about him coming again. So how does Jesus come? We've got five observations from this passage about, about how Jesus comes. And first we see that, that Jesus comes. He comes to us. We say in that song, you did not wait for me to draw near to you. That's, that's one of the hallmarks of, of Methodist theology is that, that term prevenient grace, which just means that God takes the initiative. That God comes first. It's not like we go searching for God and he's kind of hiding away from us and we finally figure out where he is, but that God comes to us. The God is like the good shepherd when there's the, even though they got the 99 safe, that one lost sheep is out there, the good shepherd goes looking and seeks out to seek and save the lost and, and bring it back. The God takes the initiative. He didn't stay back far. And that happens in, in the Christmas story, Jesus coming to earth, but also the way that, that he seeks us out in our own lives when we didn't yet know the Lord, the different things were, were coming into our lives to, to guide us. Maybe it was a, a, a Christian family that took us to church as a youngster and we learned the ways. Maybe it was somebody that got to sit in Elena's Sunday school classes or nursery and, and feel the love of God. Or maybe it was, maybe we got older in our lives and, and different things happened to us and all this is kind of steering us. The God is at work, always calling, 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 leading us to faith. Jesus comes to us. He takes the initiative. Second thing is that, that Jesus comes to us when we're in trouble. They were out there in the boat, and they were being buffeted by the waves because the wind was against them. <clears throat> he wants to come to us all the time, and he does come to us all the time, and sometimes we enjoy that, some, but, but sometimes we aren't all that interested or paying that much attention to his coming unless we're desperate. One of our, our neighbors, when he lived in, in Dinuba, he lived across the street from us. And actually, he didn't live there when he got there. He was in prison when we got there. And his, his wife was there with their young child. And we got to know her. And, and then he got out of prison. He started coming to the church. And, but then later, he told me a story. He was, he was, he was in prison. And that's when California passed the three strikes and you're out kind of thing. And he said, I've got two already. You know? And he was in there for his second strike. And he realized, if I keep up the way I've been going, I'm going to be dead, or I'm going to be in prison for decades. And, and he'd known about God from his childhood. He'd been to church as a little kid. And, and, and he just turned to God and said, I am royally messing up my life. I, I'm, I'm just messing this up here and there. If you think you can do anything, you have a go at it. Give it a try, because I'm not doing any good. And he, and he, he turned his life over to the Lord. And later he got out, after he got out of prison, came to church, he, he made you know, other professions of faith in Christ. But I think that's the day that he became a Christian when he, when he said, okay, I give up. You do something. Here's my life. 
someone has said that, that wit's end is faith's beginning. We often don't realize our need until we're in trouble. And we can't appreciate the sustaining power that's available to us until we need it, until we've got some difficulties, until we're weak. We don't need that power. And so we are more aware of God coming to us when we're in times of trouble. I know in our own family, when my mom had cancer, which she later died from that cancer, the whole extended family drew closer to God as, as a result of this. And we get in trouble in this life. This life has lots of troubles. Jesus said, in this world you will have tribulations. So take courage, I've overcome the world. We get in trouble in this life. Sometimes it's the result of our own foolish actions, and we're reaping the consequences of that. Other times it's because of the harmful actions of others that were inflicted on us. And sometimes it's nobody in particular's fault. It's just a rough world that we live in, and, and things happen, and, and we get on the bad end of it sometimes. Trouble could be an illness, or it could be a relationship problem, or, or financial needs. It could be an addiction, issues at work, mental health struggles. Jesus wants to be part of our whole life, not just our church life. Our whole life, which includes the troubles in our life. And he's eager to come to us when we're struggling. So Jesus comes to us. Jesus comes to us when we're in trouble. Third is that, that Jesus comes to us with power. Jesus came walking on the water, not on stepping stones. He was walking on the water out across the Sea of Galilee, and, and there, it's impossible. It can't be done. And then, and then when he got into the boat, he stopped the storm. It's impossible, but he did it because, and they realized he must be the Son of God. He's not just, he's, he's performing great miracles. And Jesus still has the power to do impossible things, or things that seem impossible to us at least, to change lives, to, to if, he can, if he can calm a storm, he can calm an out of control temper. He can break addictions, he can heal broken bodies, he can heal broken relationships, he can heal broken hearts, he can transform and heal a broken world. And I pray that he will restore a divided nation. He has power to overcome injustice. And to overcome my bad habits, bad attitudes, power to revive a fainting soul, to revive a congregation, to bring revival to a country. Do you need some power today? Jesus comes with power. Fourth observation is that, that sometimes we are scared when Jesus comes. The disciples thought he was a ghost or something. Because he's walking on the water and people can't do that. Ah, it's scary. There's something supernatural happening. They're afraid. Although I don't remember them being afraid when he was supernaturally feeding the 5,000. They didn't say that they were afraid. They were maybe in awe of that. They didn't say that they were. But here they were afraid. They thought it might be a ghost and they cried out with fear. We can't categorize Jesus. We don't really understand. We don't know how to handle him. And if we can put Jesus in a box, then our Jesus is too small. Because we can't make big enough boxes for him. That Jesus is, is mysterious, and he's wild, and he's surprising. They did not expect him to come walking out on the water. And they didn't even know that it was him, and they were afraid. And then Jesus said, hey, it's me. You don't need to be afraid. They still didn't understand how he's walking on the water. And we don't need to understand all of the, the mystery about Jesus, how he could be fully human and fully divine at the same time, and how he could set aside his divine powers to live this earthly life, yet he could still do miracles. And like how, did, how he could take our sins upon himself on the cross, how that happens, I don't know, but we can trust that it does happen. We can believe. And so we don't, we don't need to know all the answers about Jesus, but we can know Jesus. We can know him personally. He didn't explain how he was walking on the water. He said, it's me. It is I. Do not be afraid. When we come to know his goodness and love, then we don't need to fear what he does in our life. He comes to save, to help, and to heal. 
And sometimes, this probably was with the disciples, we're, we're just afraid or kind of freaked out by, by supernatural experiences. So they, they thought it was some kind of phantom on the water. And, but sometimes, you know, we can be kind of shocked or freaked out if we see a miracle or someone speaking in tongues or exercising the gift of prophecy. Or sometimes we're in a, a powerful worship experience. We just feel God's presence. Or we see somebody else who's feeling God's presence, and they manifest that in, in ways that seem odd to us. One time we were with, uh, we'd taken a youth group down to Disneyland, actually, and we were, we were at a big church down in Southern California, and, and some kind of revival meeting was going on, and one of our members was there, uh, one of the adults, you know, one of the chaperones, and, and afterwards he said, oh, when, when they started doing that, I, I felt kind of scared, I felt kind of weird, and... and and at first I, I was saying, oh, you know, yeah, they were just, you know, it's a little bit unusual the way they were doing it. That's not quite the way that we worship. And, um, he goes, no, I just felt this kind of a chill come through me. I said, oh, Lupe, that was God. And he was like, oh, no. I mean, he, was, he was worried about it. But um, it was. And God did some great things in his life um, that day and in, in days after that. Even if it seems a little bit weird. Even if it's something that we're not familiar with, something happens to us that, that doesn't fit in our scheme or wasn't, wasn't typed out in the worship bulletin, that I would have that kind of you know, supernatural experience there in church. If it's from God, then it's okay. And we don't need to be afraid of it. Sometimes we're afraid when Jesus is coming because we're afraid that he's going to reject us. We've, we've done things... We have shame, we have guilt, we feel inadequate, and we think, oh, God couldn't want me after what I've done, after the things I've been through, after the things that have been done to me. And, and we think that we're going to be rejected and not accepted, not loved, that we'll be condemned. We're afraid when Jesus comes that he's going to get us, that he's going to punish us, that he's going to reject us. But he won't. He came to save us. While we were yet sinners, he loved us enough to die on the cross. That doesn't send us and keep him away from us. It draws him to us. Because he said it's not the healthy that need the doctor, it's the sick that need a doctor. And he comes to seek and to save the lost. Sometimes we're afraid of Jesus because we're afraid he'll reject us, but he won't. Sometimes we're afraid that Jesus will want to change us. And he will. But that won't be doesn't have to be a scary thing either. It's going to be a good change. We imagine that we like our sin. Like, oh, I don't want to give that up. That's one of my favorite naughty things to do. Oh, I don't want to, you know, this is, this, this habit. Well, I can't, it's not a very good habit, but I just don't think I can give it up. And, and we're afraid to. And we imagine that we like our sin even when it's killing us. And so those that are, that are addicted to, to drugs or to alcohol, even though it is destroying every good thing in their life, they're often afraid to give it up because they can't quite imagine facing life without it. And, and they're afraid to let it go, even though it's destroying them. Sometimes we're afraid to let go of our bitterness, our unloving attitudes of prejudice, destructive habits, misplaced priorities. And... Everyone's uncomfortable with change, but the changes that Jesus wants to make in us are going to be good changes. It's going to make us into the kind of people that we were created to be. So we're afraid that Jesus is going to want to change us, and he will, but we don't need to be afraid. Because it's, it is I, he says. Don't be afraid. The changes that he brings are going to be good changes. He rescues us from destructive ways of living we don't need to fear. And then finally, number five, when Jesus comes, he also calls us to come. So he's there walking on the water. They're afraid he's a ghost. Peter, Jesus says, no, it's me. And, and I don't know what got into Peter. Maybe it was God. But he, he says, if it's you, Lord, tell me to get it to walk to you on the water. Like, when I said that story, I thought, I don't think that would ever would have popped into my mind that that would be the response, that I'm, I'm shocked that Jesus is doing it. Why would I think that I am going to do it? I don't know why Peter, I don't know why Peter said that. Peter kind of blurted out things sometimes. Maybe, maybe he just wanted to be 
with Jesus. To be like, if you're doing it, Jesus, then I want to do it too. And maybe, maybe that was what it was. Or maybe, maybe he was so confident that if Jesus is doing it, he can help me do it. Because he healed people and he sent us out and I healed people. He cast out demons and he sent us out and I cast out demons. He's walking on the water. I suppose I could do that too if he says so. Maybe that's what he was thinking. It's amazing that, that Peter says this. That he, that he asked Jesus to ask him to come out on the water. And I don't know whether Jesus, you know, was surprised that, that Peter said that. Like, whoo, that's an interesting thing to say, Peter. Okay, if you want to, come on. And, and, and Peter does it. He doesn't, like, at that point think, wow, that was kind of a weird thing to say. No, that's, that's okay, Jesus. You just come in. The, I'm, I'm sure it's you coming in the boat. He's, he's, he just he climbs out of the boat and he gets up. And then he walks on the water. Peter walks on it. He's not the son of God. He walks on the water. Jesus giving him the, the power. Jesus gives us the, anything that Jesus calls us to do, he'll give us the power to do. If he calls us to walk on the water, we can walk on the water. Peter could walk on the water. He did walk on the water. Now, now bless him, he's out of the boat, he's walking on his way, and then logic starts to kick in, and he thinks, I can't walk on the water. There's all these, what am I doing out here? Why am I out of the boat? Why did I even say that? This is a dumb idea. I should have thought, and as he, as he had, he starts thinking. You know, he, he takes his eyes off Jesus, he starts noticing the problems of what he can't, instead of what he's already doing, he's convinced he can't do it because it's impossible. And he starts to sink and calls out for help and Jesus saves him. But I don't want to focus so much on, on that part of it, but on the part that, and then we get back to the point where Jesus comes to Peter when he's in trouble, you know. But <clears throat> I want to focus on the point that, that, G, that Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water, that Jesus actually did it, that Jesus called him, and he came, and he did something amazing and miraculous, and that, and that you and I can do anything that God calls us to do. He's not going to ask us to do something and then laugh at us as we fail because it's impossible. He's going to give us the tools we need to do it. He'll do it through us. It might not be walking on water. It might be walking across the room to welcome somebody might not be being a missionary going off to a far off land, although it might be. It might be being a missionary to your neighbor and telling them the good news about Jesus, inviting them to church, helping a child to follow Jesus by teaching Sunday school or working in vacation Bible school, or, or starting a Bible study in your home or volunteering to be one of our connecting Bible study um, callers. Praying with a coworker at work. As you find out there's another Christian there, maybe you'd like to sit down and, and pray at lunch hour together. Maybe somebody else will, will come and join you. Or maybe God's calling us to, to forgive someone in particular. And you think, ah, they, they really did me wrong. I don't know if I can do that. But God can do it through you. Maybe God's calling you to practice generous, proportional giving. Or to bless somebody with words of encouragement. You can do it. Here comes Jesus. He's, we're going to see, see him walking on the water. He's coming and he'll make us whole if we'll let him. And he calls us to come and to join in his work, to get out of the boat, to get out of the chair, to get out of the comfort zone, to answer his call. You can do whatever God calls you to do. We, as a church, can do whatever God calls us to do. As we close in prayer, I invite you to think of the situation. It could, be, it could be your own life or in somebody else's life close to you, where you want to invite Jesus to come into that situation. Whether it's some trouble that you're going through or that somebody else is going through, whether it's someone that needs Jesus to come into their life in the first time and say, yes, I want to be a follower of Jesus. Whether somebody needs or you need a redirection in life or help with a specific thing, or a miracle to happen in your life, or a healing to happen in your life, whatever it is that you need, invite you to invite Jesus to come into that situation with his power and his love today. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you are almighty. We thank you, Jesus, that you came upon this earth and that you did things that helped your disciples to understand that you are the Son of God, God the Son. Lord, we thank you that you laid aside your powers and depended on 
on the power of God through the outworking of the Holy Spirit in your life that is also available to us. And just like Peter walked on the water, you let us do things that we can't do on our own. Lord, come into our lives. Come into our lives in a new and fresh way with new power, with new confidence. Lord, there are situations in our lives, maybe where we're really struggling. The wind and the waves are against us, God. Come. Come into that situation. Lord, there are people that we care about deeply who are, are struggling with, who are being inundated by the waves. Lord, they're not making it. Lord, come into that situation. Bring your power. Bring your love. Bring your wisdom into those situations. Lord, we thank you that you are, you are the God who comes. And we open ourselves, and in prayer we invite you into, into our loved ones' situation as well. Come, Lord Jesus, do your great work. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I invite you to sing now, Here Comes Jesus, a favorite song of mine. It, it was popular quite a few years ago. <clears throat> Here Comes Jesus. I invite you to stand as you can. situation in our lives and those of our loved ones now and forever. Amen. <laughs>